Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for those of you who are in the room and the many who are online uh, for being part of this incredibly timely and incredibly important conversation about freedom of speech with, uh, with a person who is not only a First Amendment attorney uh, and author of a book that I hope we'll, we'll get to, to discuss and which I recommend to uh, to all of you is a, is a really very well done and thought provoking critique of uh, of higher education and but pointing at things that we could do better. But also someone who's dedicated uh, his life professionally to improving uh, freedom of, of speech in college campuses as the as the leader of an organization called Fire that uh, examines uh, freedom of speech in our in our universities and. Uh, that I've gotten to know uh, throughout the year. So, Greg, thank you so much, and welcome to Georgia Tech. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And um, we're going to have a a conversation, but at some point I'm going to take uh, questions from the audience here or from uh, uh, those folks online. So uh, take notes, and, and I'll get back to you in a in a second. I'm going to start by asking Greg in in a way to to lay out some of the the key arguments in the in in the book, if if you will. And and I, I guess my prompt will be a um, a quote that you have uh, in the front end of the book: "Prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child." Which I guess has a the higher education version of that quote uh, is probably a University of California. Legendary president uh, Clark Kerr, with uh, the role of the university should be to make students safe for ideas, not ideas safe for students. So, with that, tell us about the main arguments in the book, and I'll, we'll, we'll take the conversation from there. Well, um, it all goes back to me being have to, uh, having to be hospitalized for depression back in 2007. I was uh, I tried to kill myself. I, I was in a very bad, very bad place, um, and I'd been working culture war, um, because I've been working, defending free speech on campus by that time for about six years. Um, and I was studying cognitive behavioral therapy to try to pull myself out of the, uh, out of that very dark. And as I was doing that, I was realizing, okay, so one way, a way to address your own depression and anxiety is to teach yourself, um, to not engage in cognitive distortions, which include things like overgeneralizing, um, binary thinking that everything's either zero or one, um, catastrophizing that relatively small things are terrible, mind reading, so you don't really know what people think. And as I, as I was studying this stuff, I was saying to myself, well, campuses seem to be kind of modeling catastrophizing all the time. They, they seem to actually be engaging in behavior that seem to almost um, teach uh, cognitive distortions by example. But thank goodness students weren't buying it. Um, at the time, students were the best constituency for freedom of speech. This was true all the way up until about 2012. They got free speech. Um, and then sometime around 2014, just suddenly you started seeing students showing up for campus who were demanding new speech codes. They were demanding people be disinvited. Um, they were demanding things I haven't heard before, mic microaggressions, trigger warnings, all this stuff. And it didn't happen slowly. It happened very suddenly in, in 2014. And they were arguing that they needed all of these for medicalized reasons. And suddenly I was like, oh no, those are, but these justifications, these are all things that if you believe them, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy, going to make you anxious and depressed if you believe them, just like CBT can teach us. So I wrote an article with this, with my friend Jonathan Hyde about this, it, making the argument that the same things that are a threat to freedom of speech are eventually going to threaten mental health as well. And we said that in 2015, we didn't have the data at that point. We were just hearing stories from campus, pretty persuasive stories, but but nonetheless. And then when we finally saw the data, the mental health went, you know, off a cliff. It was really bad in terms of anxiety, depression, mood disorders, suicide, uh, you know, among uh, college age um, young people. And so things got so much worse after 2015. We decided to write a book in 2018, and the the, the setup for the book. Kind of the same way that we tried to give sort of not necessarily we tried to give what I call negative advice that essentially people don't really listen to you when you tell them do the following 15 things. But if you tell them do whatever you want, but don't do these things, that they, they get a little more receptive. So what we talk about in the book is it's as if we were giving a generation of young people the advice. Um, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Um, always trust your feelings. 
and life is a battle between good people and evil people. And we call these the three great untruths because both in terms of um, ancient philosophy and ancient wisdom traditions, these are all terrible ideas, but also in terms of modern psychology, these are all bad pieces of advice. And then we turn around to the audience, if we can all agree, you know, um, that these are terrible ideas, why do we seem to be teaching this to a generation of young people? Because it's going to damage discourse, but it's also gonna, gonna damage mental health. And this came out in 2018, and things unfortunately have just gotten a lot worse since then. So um, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, why is freedom of speech particularly important and central to the university, to the academic? Mm -hmm. Freedom of speech is something um, that is very rare in human history. Uh, and I think sometimes we do a disservice for the, um, uh, to the Enlightenment, in a sense, by calling it the Enlightenment. It, it sounds like suddenly everybody just woke up one day, had a revelation, and now we get everything. I actually much prefer, uh, I first introduced this idea in Yuval Harari's work, but it's a, another author came up with it, to think of it as the discovery of ignorance. That essentially the Enlightenment was mostly realizing all these folk intuitions we had about the way the world really works, they're all wrong. As soon as you test them, they're nonsense. Um, we're actually not very good at guessing um, what's true. We're not very good at guessing if someone's being honest. We're not good at guessing what physics should look like. Um, all, all of these stories that we had about the way reality looks like, they're all just wrong. Um, and the, one of the ways that you get towards truth is by being able to hypothesize ideas, to be able to talk them out, and to be able to experiment and test. And time and time again, the thing that you really desperately want to be true is not necessarily going to be true. So the place that's most supposed to um, embody this ethic, even though at the time, you know, the colleges were, were, were more like religious institutions, um, was this idea of radical open-mindedness um, in order to understand the world as it is, to overcome human bias, to, to, to allow your ideas to be tested and challenged. Um, and that is one of the, you know, guiding inspirations for higher education. Um, it became particularly um, uh, embedded in law in the 20th century um, as uh, universities in the U.S. became things that were pretty much just things that rich people went to. As you go deeper into the 20th century and it gets more egalitarian, the number of people who are going, um, it was thankfully the same time that you have a, a greater awareness of freedom of speech as a, as a folk value in the U.S., um, and you have the law, the First Amendment, um, becoming very strong for the first time in, in about the 1950s. So all of these things came together not coincidentally. You know, the, the um, civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, the women's rights movement, the, these were all things that uh, Americans had been trying to have at one level or another for decades before. Um, but they only became possible um, due to the, the, the rights revolution in the 1950s. Uh, you know, it's John Lewis, great civil rights ad, activist, um, who, who uh, recently died, who used to live in my neighborhood, you know, would say that if it wasn't for freedom of speech, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. So these might not seem like related ideas, but they are, they are completely related. And the explosion of the having, you know, a substantial portion of the United States now attends college. Um, this all happened partially because of things that were set free by freedom of speech. Unfortunately, when something's been established and uh, for a long time, there's a tendency to forget why you had it in the first place, particularly when it's something that can sometimes be as difficult to deal with as constantly having to remember that you're wrong about any number of things. Um, so free speech is you know, part and parcel um, of, of, of what higher ed is supposed to look like. It's related concept of academic freedom is of course central to what higher education is supposed to look like. Uh, we, we've had tremendous advancements thanks to these two, um, uh, but unfortunately, when something's been around for a long time, you tend to take it for granted. Why, um, I mean, you've articulated how um, long it took yep. humanity to come up with this idea, how important it is for how, how, why is it so hard? I think every college president, by the way, we have uh, two members of our board of regents in, uh, in the room, a chairman and vice chairman, welcome. Errol and Aaron for, for being here. Every college president, and I suspect any member of, of a board of a university has received a version of this letter mm -hmm. or this call, right? There's nobody who's a stronger defendant <laughs> of the First Amendment 
than I am. Yeah. Pause. But. However, <laughs> come on. Something happened on the campus which should not have been allowed. Yeah. These are not people who disagree with the First Amendment. These are people who actually yeah. believe in it, that they, they, they think it's important. And even for those people, it's a hard concept to, to, to grasp or to apply. Why is it? Um, why is it difficult to live with, with freedom of speech? Um, partially, you know, because we're tribal by nature, um, that, that essentially, you know, people tend to see things as us, us versus them. That's one of the reasons why we called this a great untruth um, it, it, in the book. You know, people can be superstitious. Um, and we're also very biased towards, you know, not wanting to be wrong. So we tend to think that the way we see things is the way that anybody should see, see things. Um, and, you know, historically, uh, when it comes to the development of the idea of, of, of freedom of speech, some of the some of it didn't develop in part because it wasn't even practical to be able to talk to all that many people until the printing press and certainly l later the Internet, and the social media revolution. I, it's one of the reasons why I get so excited about psychology is, that, is I think psychology does a better job of explaining why free speech is a difficult um, uncomfortable thing that you're supposed to live with. But if you don't stress the fact that it's supposed to make you uncomfortable, then you're missing a, a part of the, a major part of the point. I mean, this is what I say all the time. Um, you know, being offended is what happens when you have your deepest beliefs challenged. And if you make it through four years of un undergrad without ever being offended, um, you should demand your money back. So, so we are, uh, I'm, I'm gonna now use this as an opportunity to get advice from you, we have sure. an unfolding case. Just, I mean, this is our life probably every week, every month, there's something like this, but there's yeah. a case right now unfolding on our campus, mm -hmm. right? So um, I think earlier this week, we had a, a, a conservative um, a commentator spoke on campus, invited by students uh, who disagrees that the NCAA should allow a transgender woman uh, to, to compete in the swimming championships that are taking place here. So you have conservative, speaker expressing his views at the invitation of a group of students. Mm. Then you have another group outside protesting to green with those, with those ideas. And then after the whole thing is done, then we get some messages again from alums and friends of the university saying, wait, are you not going to sanction the students, the protesting students, or are you not going to apologize for the fact that this group of students has been protesting. Yeah. You're now my my chief advisor, sure. head of uh, Georgia Tech Communications. Yep. Please advise. Sure. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a it, pretty straightforward First Amendment principles. Um, you know, can you keep someone from uh, disrupting a speech or preventing other people from hearing it? Yes. And, and, a, and a school should, um, you know, let speeches go on to allow people to, you know, um, if they're coming to this talk, they should be, some, someone in the audience shouldn't be deciding for everybody else that they can't hear us. That's part of the principle of, of the speech in the first place. And this is something that I feel like people actually get almost like purposely obtuse about. Like they, they, they were like, well, it's just free speech that I'm shouting down a speaker. And it's like, no, that's not the way it works. There's 40 other people here who are here for the speech. Um, that's also known as mob censorship. But if it's outside protesting, then that's a no brainer. Like that, that's basic first amendment uh, law. You, you can, pro you, well, you absolutely have the right to protest a speaker you don't like. Um, I have, one thing that has been disturbing though that has changed, and it sounds like from everything I've heard about the way you've handled both of these situations, you handled them exactly right according to the first amendment. Um, the thing that I have been kind of distressed by in the last 10 years that it didn't used to be the case, is that uh, all of that makes sense. Um, but when it comes to you know, pro pro uh, professor's speech, uh, we'll have people saying, well, it's just someone's free speech right to demand that someone get fired. And it's like, this is true, but it wasn't, it wasn't the case for most of my career that students would immediately say, this professor needs to be fired for having the wrong opinion, written the wrong book, said the wrong thing in class, allegedly, um, said the wrong thing online. There's been a shift towards there has to be some kind of punishment as opposed to it's really important that I let you know I disagree with this person, which are fundamentally different mm -hmm. things. Like when you fire a professor for what they say, that's an easy academic freedom slash free speech uh, violation. 
if you think what this person is saying is horrible, then you have all the right in the world to protest it. But somehow th this weird extra idea of this person has to be removed from this university, this person has to be fired or expelled, it's gotten much more punitive um, in, in the last couple of years. We, we had um, a very interesting process. I, I arrived back to uh, Georgia Tech as president in, in 2019, spent the first year crafting a new strategic plan. As part of that, we did a lot of soul searching and wrote our values. Mm -hmm. and, um, and one value has to do with freedom of inquiry and expression. Mm -hmm. um, I argued that that value has to go hand in hand with another one, which is we thrive on diversity. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the value on inquiry of expression says we protect the freedom of all members of our community to ask questions, seek truth, and express their views. But the, the one with Thrive on Diversity says we see diversity of backgrounds and perspectives mm -hmm. as essential to learning, discovery, and creation. And I was delighted that in, in your book about freedom of speech, you bring diversity of perspective Absolutely. Or, or point of view diversity, I think you yeah. call it. Tell me about the interplay between those oh, two. Oh, sure, yeah. So there's a difference between freedom of speech and things that make freedom of speech more useful. Um, freedom of speech is sort of, it's necessary but not sufficient to producing better ideas. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have robust freedom of speech. People can, you know, challenge the unchallengeable, like they say at the Yale Woodward Report, you know, like to, to think the unthinkable, to, to mention the unmentionable. Um, but the and you get ten students together and they all completely agree with each other on everything, um, unless they just happen to coincidentally uh, be that one they have is just exactly right. And that's just a coincidence. That's just luck that the ten people who show up completely agree on it. They're not going to get any new ideas. They're not going to make any progress towards testing those ideas for coming up with new ones. Uh, unless there are some people on there who disagree and are a, and are skilled, particularly at, at disagreeing um, productively, and I think that that's one of the reasons why, even though I'm you know I, I'm politically liberal, I do think that a lot of schools uh, this this issue of whether or not um, you have viewpoint diversity among your faculty is a very important concept. I used to be a, a little more sort of uncomfortable with it, but particularly as you know, I'm a constitutional lawyer who's gotten very interested in psychology, it's just true that if, that if you have too much agreement um, in a community, you tend to see yourself as what my co-author John Haidt calls a coherent moral community. And then you start engaging in groupthink. Um, you which, tend to, which one? Yeah, you, you, start seeing, you, you start seeing outsiders as, you know, um, as savages, essentially. Um, that constructive uh, uh, respect for and willingness to hear out uh, points of view that are dissenting in, in, in your community is, it is very health, healthy. It tends to produce better ideas. And it also helps you remember that not every decent person in the world thinks precisely like you. So I do think that the diversity of viewpoints is very important to have on campus. Um, and I think that unfortunately, um, at least according to the studies that we've been doing all over the country, students are really scared to, to, to speak their minds on a lot of stuff. But the, I think the numbers of students who say they don't self-censor is, is something like 10%, and, exactly. that's, and that's a tiny fraction of the, of the ones who would be the most politically mainstream at, at that school. That means there are people who are, you know, probably politically agree on 99% of what the school, who are still saying they self-censor. And this is like five or six studies now saying that students are, they're like, mm, no, I'm not gonna disagree with my professor, I'm not gonna disagree with my classmates, it's just not worth it. Let me um, ask you about the politics of, uh, of freedom of speech, a concept that, of course, should be apolitical, mm -hmm. right? Should be one sort of a basic, basic norm of, of the conduct. And yet, I was thinking, I mentioned earlier, uh, President, University of California President Clark Kerr, um, who was actually fired mm -hmm. when uh, Reagan was elected governor soon after. I did I, not know that. He did, and, and part of the reason why, by the way, he has the best quote when he got fired. He said, I'm leaving the presidency the same way I came to it, fired with enthusiasm. That was, that was it. <laughs> That's and pretty the, good. And the, but the, the, the reason he was fired at the time was because he refused to sanction students that have been liberal students who had been protesting yeah. uh, very aggressively against it was the Vietnam era and a whole bunch of things. And it turns out, so freedom of speech appears to be more of a of a concern 
of yeah. the progressive side of the political spectrum. Now it seems to be more of a concern of the of the conservative side of the political spectrum. How did that happen? Yeah, that's I call it the slow motion train wreck. Um, when I was watching this, uh, I worked at the AC I went to law school in '97. Um, I worked at the ACLU in 1999 in my third year. And you could already see it coming then, because I, I was at Stanford for law school, and Stanford um, didn't talk a lot about it, but it was one of the schools that passed speech codes in the 90s. Um, nominally attempts to make uh, it, it campuses more inclusive by trying to police um, a speech that was considered racist or sexist, often ended up being speech that was simply expression of a political opinion, anything from opposing affirmative action, to at University of Michigan, for example, um, the the first like three groups of students who got in trouble at University of Michigan for a policy that was designed to uh, nominally to help protect uh, uh, African American students at University of Michigan, the, fir the first people brought up in charges were black students um, at University of Michigan. Now, for a First Amendment lawyer, this is utterly predictable. This is exactly what happens every time: is the law that you think is going to make the whole world better is going to be used by actual people, and they're going to use it in a way that you're not going to like, and it's and given it's enforced by people in power, they're going to uh, do it in ways that, that people in power would appreciate. And what I'm, what I'm saying here is that this evolution from free speech being very much associated with the left um, to be more associated with the right is at least in part due to the tremendous success of left-leaning people on college campuses. This is what I mean. So liberalism, of course, if you don't believe in free speech, I do object when people when people call themselves liberals because liberal means freedom. <laughs> and and if you're uh, if you no longer believe in free speech, call yourself something else, call yourself progressive. That's fine. Um, but I, I think that growing up, the defining idea of being liberal was uh, was believing in, in, in freedom of speech. But on campuses, the amount of viewpoint diversity has gone from about uh, it's not as if campuses were ever particularly conservative. They're, they went from being about two to one um, liberal to conservative to now um, they're about, depending on the department, they're six to one. Um, uh, some departments are 30 to one or 40 to one. Like the, the numbers were much worse than I thought going into writing this book with, with John Haidt. And when you're in charge, absolutely, you move on from being a minority point of view because minority points of view always need freedom of speech. Um, I mean, I, to take a brief digression, I have to explain this to, um, to to students. I'm sure that not I'm sure that everyone here knows this, but it's worth repeating. Um, historically, people have seemed to be taught these days that free speech is the argument of the bigot, the bully, and the robber baron. And I always have to make the explain. It's like, well, by the way, robber barons, rich and powerful po folks, they've always done just fine because they're rich and powerful. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to you know bullying um, or or being bigoted, if it's the will of the majority um, in a democracy, um, you get uh, you get to decide. So if you have 51% of the vote um, and you're a bully or, or or whatever, you 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 get to make the rules. You literally only need a First Amendment uh, or a concept of free speech to protect minority points of view. And political liberals in the 19th century came around to the idea that free speech was this incredible tool for progress. And like I said, it proved to be true. Uh, gay rights movement, women's rights movement, uh, civil rights movement all became possible after the First Amendment started being interpreted strongly in, in the 1950s. And these were all people who self-identified as liberals. But as you start getting super majorities of different political persuasions, uh, of left-leaning persuasion on campus, uh, then you start seeing, oh, okay, well, actually, this isn't perfect. This isn't paradise. This isn't, um, there, there, I can actually see some downsides to this. People are still allowed to say, you know, horrible things. And, and now I think, now that we're actually in the majority, I think we should be shutting this down. Um, and that's a very normal progression. It didn't happen very fast because older liberals, people more from my generation, still believed in freedom of speech at the core of their being. So one of the reasons why you didn't have um, some of this turn, turn on free speech earlier, even though you had some of it, is partially because there was this liberal idea that free speech is important. But the younger people coming up, um, they think free speech is part of the problem. And the thing that I think is so mind blowing about this is yes, it's because universities are very powerful. They're fairly politically homogenous. Um, they're incredibly influential. They're very wealthy. They tend to be somewhat in a, in a bubble. And under those circumstances, you bet you see free speech as part of the problem. 
So I think that the switch came, there was greater free speech, um, uh, uh, greater, greater species skepticism on my side because we got, frankly, too powerful and too influential. When it comes to conservatives um, coming around to freedom of speech, there was a kind of conservative that has always been great on freedom of speech. And that's actual libertarians. Um, when it comes to libertarians, in, um, I'm not a libertarian, uh, but when it comes to free speech, they have been consistently some of the best people on this, and, and they get it as a, as a neutral value. When it comes to people who are more politically conservative, um, when it comes to anybody who's, whose partisan identity uh, places before their, uh, their political identity, um, they tend to see free speech as a means to an end. That being said, I mean, when you look at what the American people think on freedom of speech, um, we are very pro-freedom of speech. We're very unusual as a country. But on campuses, um, we're, we're surprisingly out of step. Uh, and, and this kind of shift so that conservatives can portray themselves as being more the champion of free speech, it only makes sense partially due to the dynamics of American higher ed today. It's a long answer, but no, no, I, fascinating, fascinating. I appreciate that analysis. Let, let's let's um, come back to your book. And by the way, it's a New York Times bestseller, "The Coddling of the American Mind." And um, and I guess you try to make friends in higher education by <laughs> talking about all the uh, untouchable topics, trigger warnings. Yeah. Safe spaces. Yep. I mean, you went through the whole list. I actually. That's why we thought we were getting our head chopped off when, when, when the original article came out. We were like, eh. and and that was not the reaction, right? No, but I mean, you still got a. The, the reaction was actually overwhelmingly positive um, for for many months. Uh, so so actually, and and by the way, what I um, for those of you, I I strongly recommend the book, and it's it's incredibly nuanced about even about what a trigger warning is, what it's meant to do, and what the risks and what the, are. And what the science says. And what the science says. Yeah. So, so uh, but tell, tell us a little bit about, about that. And your issue, this, this conversation around high fragility and, yeah. and, and why all these safety, extra safety measures are yeah. not good. But, well, just to get the, the, the topic of trigger warnings, trigger warnings are definitely one of those things that um, they, they have a very sort of um, – privileged place, I, I think, in some circles of, in higher education. And this was a, a very strange sort of sudden shift in my experience. Uh, trigger warnings, as best we can tell, started on campuses in the 90s, but overwhelmingly as ways to talk about things like sexual assault, uh, you know, or, or, or sec child sexual abuse. Um, uh, really, you know, unspeakable things that you can understand that someone would want sort of a warning before going into. Um, so these started on uh, websites, you know, around 2010, 2009, but even by 2012, they were already kind of going out of fashion, partially because the number of things they were being requested for just got bigger and bigger. Um, and it was a, a lot of uh, feminist, the one saying, no, this is, we've jumped the shark on this, which was why it was kind of surprising that you started getting the movement for trigger warnings on campus, really taking up, um, uh, becoming powerful in, in 2014. Now, when people haven't read the book um, or when they've just seen, you know, other people's, you know, uh, bad takes on it, it's kind of like, oh, you hate trigger warnings. I'm like, I don't hate trigger warnings. They, here, and here's what we're saying. One, there are mainstream psychological reasons for thinking they could actually be harmful, like in the sense that if you tell something, something's going to harm them, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, flat out. Um, there is no evidence that they're in any way helpful. There have now been five studies done, uh, I think at minimum five studies done on trigger warnings. Not a single one of them show any benefit whatsoever, um, uh, including to people who have PTSD, which is what they're nominally there, there to help with. And there were a couple of them that, that had two surprising um, side effects. One is that it made people more anxious um, before t talking about a topic because, and this is, hype came up, it, the way he explains it, it's kind of like the equivalent of playing the scary music in advance. It can actually make someone uh, m more anxious. And uh, there was a great study that um, was uh, done by a scholar at Harvard, who I really respect, that um, found that it tended to increase skepticism of, uh, about speech, period. Um, and so no evidence that they're helpful. Plenty of mainstream psychological reasons for thinking that they could be harmful because they people to believe that they're more fragile uh, and more easily harmed than they actually are. But the one that is really hard to, um, uh, that hasn't been included in any of these studies is when you talk to professors, they will, you know, there are a lot of professors who will, will, will tell you that they're avoiding talking, for example, 
um, about sexual assault um, in criminal law classes in, in, in um, law school. And that's something that you always talk about in criminal law because it, it, int it introduces some very interesting topics of, of, of motivation and like what the standard should be to find someone guilty of, of a crime that's hard to prove. Um, and that, you know, Jeannie Souk, who's a professor at um, Harvard, was talking about how, they're, they're, you know, law, law professors are actually, they're, they're not even covering this topic anymore. And what's terrible there is that means who's going to suffer the most. That means, you know, victims of sexual assault are, are the people who's, who suffer the most if people don't know actually the law related to it. So I think that as a chilling, and when you add in the fact that as a chilling effect to important discussions, I think that the, um, the, the research, you know, indicates that these things, um, that people aren't really thinking through the whole idea of, of how these could actually be harmful, because really the main thing they're saying is it seems intuitively like that's a kind or compassionate thing to do, but not everything that seems intuitively to be kind, compassionate, or thoughtful actually is. Well, following the list of, uh, of uh, difficult topics to discuss, especially in higher education, yeah. let's talk about safe spaces. Safe spaces, yes. No, and, and, because I, here's, here's my question. I, remember I was a grad student here in the early 90s, and um, I guess, I don't know, that uh, at the time the term had not been even coined. But yeah. I, I, was, I was a foreign student from Spain, and I do remember having, I guess, my own version of a safe space, met in weekends with Spanish-speaking friends. Mm -hmm. It was my place to recharge, to relax, give me the strength to go back on uh, Monday. This is a space where we could speak Spanish, play dominoes. We may or may not have some tequila going with it. <laughs> um, but it was, a, it was a place to, ah, I, I, I could be more myself, recharge. And then on Monday, I was ready for more, to go back to my, to my classes. And uh, by the way, eventually I did so well in integrating with the natives that I ended up marrying one of them. So, so it, the whole thing worked. Good for us. Yeah. <laughs> so, but now, but now in retrospect is, wow, I, was, was that a, maybe that was a safe space. And maybe that's if I'm, if I were a, a, a gay student on campus, I, I would also want to have that space where I can be a little bit more like <sighs> at ease in recharge. Or if I'm a, I'm a black student in a, uh, in a, in a place where maybe black students are a minority. I see the value in that. Mm -hmm. What's the risk? The thing about safe spaces that makes the discussion so much more difficult is at this point I've seen seven or eight different definitions of what a safe space even is. Um, that essentially uh, the one you're talking about is part and parcel of freedom of association. You know, getting together a group of people who have an affinity, who might have uh, similarities in terms of upbringing or language or culture, um, getting together with them for uh, fun and relax uh, and, and relaxing yeah you know you, that's part of freedom of speech that's part of freedom of association that you're able you're able to get together with groups like that when it comes to um you know the t the only times i've seen safe spaces be problematic at all really have been when people will talk about this whole campus is my safe space or this person can't come and speak um you know yale and harvard for example have residential dorms um, and I remember students saying that, you know, you can't have a, uh, that they have um, educational dorms and that you, you, they would regularly have speakers there saying that they come to speak in the dorms because they don't like that person's point of view because it's, it's their safe space. That's where we make the distinction between safe space as a shield, basically saying, I'm getting my friends together who have a, a shared interest as I do. Totally fine. There's, there's no issue with that. Um, but if you're saying that uh, because I am expanding the domain, you know, of my safe space, and therefore this person can't come and give a talk, that's that's an, an inappropriate use use for it. Now, th another definition of safe space, one that I actually kind of miss, was the one I was first exposed to as a safe space. When we used to say this is a safe space in the '90s, what we meant was this is a place where everyone can be frank with each other, uh -huh. and nobody's going to speak a word of it. Um, and that, to me, is something that's even more desperately needed in the in the age of cell phones. People don't trust each other for very good reasons. They, like you're going to take a picture of it, you're going to you're going to send this to you know um, you're going to send this around Twitter or Snapchat, and next thing you know you know my my life is going to be ruined. I, and I think that that has really messed with the way we this lack of trust, the way we talk to each other. So like having um, environments where people can have frank discussions. Um, even on very difficult topics, with the idea that you know none of this none of this leaves the room, I think is actually a, a great 
um, a great loss, uh, a, a great loss to culture as it currently exists on campus. So a reminder to the audience, both in the room and, and online, to be thinking about uh, your questions, and I'll get to you in a, in a second. But I, um, what, one of the things I liked about the book is that it's not just a critique about what's going, what, what's, uh, what's not working well at universities, but you, you point at directions in which we can do better, right? right? Um, including, by the way, this idea of, uh, of bringing techniques from, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. and, in, in other areas. Walk me, walk me through, through that maybe, let's say I'm a, a hypothetical case. I'm a, international student land in this country, someone comes to me and, and asks whether, I don't know, we have diapers in Spain, right? <laughs> uh, it may or may not have happened. So, uh -huh. so, so, so I guess, again, I, at the time, I didn't know that may have qualified as a microaggression. Yeah. Right? So I can take that and I'll be very upset. Yeah. How dare people, I mean, you know, I, I can be angry or, or I can do something do not be angry or even maybe do something to turn that into a positive conversation. How does that, how does one do that? How do you teach me to uh, not let that upset you? Well, and this is an, another thing I feel like we, where we've been, I think we explain ourselves very well in the book, but sometimes um, I, it was, oh my God, it was um, the president of Northwestern called me and height imbeciles because we don't believe in microaggressions. Basically, he came up with a list of things that, that we um, don't believe in, and it didn't even make sense. And it's like, no, no, microaggressions are real things. You, you, you absolutely can slight somebody from a different background or a different, um, uh, from a different background, whether that's racial or, or ethnic or uh, class-wise, for example. You know, like I definitely uh, felt like I was constantly running into people saying things that kind of presumed everybody else was rich, you know, um, going to a place like Stanford. And I, I thought, and microaggressions are real things, but also my mother's English. My father is Russian. Um, if you, my dad speaks seven languages. I've lived all over the place. And if you go into, and this is my, my and this could be itself a microaggression. My father would say that uh, if you if you go into someone else's country and you think that uh, they should bind by your norms, you are acting like hick. Is, is the is the way he, he he would put it that that essentially sh showing up and assuming that everybody um, agrees with what I think is nice and polite is just not a, a belief that can be sustained if you've been you know code switching your whole life or particularly been to a ton of other countries with a ton of different ton of different groups. So I think that some of some of the part of that international sophistication is you learn habits like um, you know it's like the neighborhood I grew up in. There were kids from um, uh, from Vietnam, from Korea, from uh, from Peru, from uh, from Puerto Rico, um, and uh, and you know and one of one of the other white kids was from the American South, which as a first generation was kind of like that's that was even more Be foreign. Careful with that. <laughs> I just I just I had no connection to it, you know, and. What's amazing is that meant what you had to do under the circumstances is you really had to give everyone the benefit of the doubt because you wanted to figure out where someone was actually coming from, what they were actually trying to say. And unfortunately, given that a lot of campuses um, can sometimes be very upper class, um, very insular, um, maybe people don't have as, as much international experience. It can lead to this idea that there's only one way to talk about any given topic and only one per, per, permissible opinion. Whereas people who have had more experience, you know, talking to people, particularly working class people, the idea that you can immediately, um, that you should immediately assume the absolute worst intention of what that person just said and immediately stand up and say, how dare you? That's not going to get you. Um, uh, that, that's not going to get you lots of friends who are different from you over time. That means you're giving them no benefit of the doubt whatsoever. And from a psychological standpoint, being able to um, uh, priming people so that they're looking for slights um, is a cruel thing to do to somebody to, because life is hard enough as it is. The idea of looking for additional uh, slights that might that, that that you should really fixate on something needs to be done about. Um, it's not healthy. So uh, let me, as promised, let me see if there are any, if you, by the way, if you're in the room and you have any question 
raise your hand and the microphone will make its way to, to you. And maybe I see two hands. I'll, I'll have two comments before we... And, and uh, you don't mind telling us who you are? And... Sure. Um, I'm Eric Black. I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering. And uh, my question is, do you know um, Renee Weiss, who uh, I, I, she worked at FIRE, I think it's a she, uh, and, I, and she was extremely helpful to me in uh, adjudicating a, a free speech right here at Georgia Tech in 2018 and 2019. Uh -huh. And um, I felt that she was really more of a therapist because oh, I, I feel that way about lawyers in general. Like, like if I, I go to church, or and there's I, I know lawyers. I never pay them. I just I just know them socially. So, so anyway, when I have a problem, anyway, Renee Weiss was was just like that. How, how do you spell the name? R Y N E W I. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, that's Ryan Weiss. <laughs> uh, he, he was my assistant. Um, uh, he's still he's still on my team. Um, so that's a microaggression, uh, young man. <laughs> Um, the, the uh, yeah, Ryan, Ryan is amazing and he'll really appreciate that. He's, he's a brilliant dude, University of Chicago. Um, he's, you know, I've, I've co-written a lot of stuff with him. Um, and yeah, I mean, sometimes when people call, it, it may not be that they had a right violated or that something happened to them that is in the past and there's nothing we can do about it. Sometimes just listening is the best we can do. Uh, but we do really try to and, and offer whatever advice we can to whoever contacts us. Is that normal? Does he talk with everybody, or does it, my, was my case just so interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, Greg Gibson, professor of biological sciences. Hi. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for your wonderful and important book. And President Cabrera, thank you for ha having this conversation. Uh, so I'm teaching a course in genetics and public policy this semester. It's basically based around Paige Harden's book, where she tries to contradict the notion that either there's no genetics or there's eugenics by right. coming out with anti-eugenic policies. And she's right. been attacked from left and right and center. Yeah. Um, so what we're doing is having discussions about topics from genetics and homosexuality to educational attainment, to poverty, to justice, race, gender. And that's obviously ripe for a lot of things, topics that make people uncomfortable. So I had them actually sign a version of the Chicago statement that you put in your book, which was wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to them one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, it's fabulous. It's very uplifting because they get everything you're talking about, and they're very reasonable about it. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem. When we get into class to discuss issues, and you mentioned this in your comments, I, I think there's a couple of conservatives in the class. I mean, it's a biology group, so we tend to be left-leaning. But I know I can put up poll questions and know that there are students with different views. Yeah. So they'll answer yes or no. I don't believe that. Yeah. But when we do whatever we can to get them to talk about it, absolute silence, even though we've yeah. sort of said what hap what's said in Clough 207 stays in Clough 207. Yeah. So what, my question is, in your wanderings, what have you heard about what professors and others are doing to actually enhance debate and discussion around these difficult topics? That's a great question. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is a great question. And I do think that by the time they're getting to the classroom um, afraid uh, that they're going to be, for lack of a better word, canceled for having the wrong opinion, um, it, it, it's almost already too late. Uh, I do think that I've been shocked at the fact that I can only think of two schools that do a introductory course on freedom of inquiry. Um, because Academic freedom, freedom of inquiry is a difficult process. It requires a different way of looking at the world. And like, uh, uh, to, to give you an example, I have, I, I have used this very controversial phrase, scholarly detachment. And I've had students be like, well, no, we can't talk about that. <laughs> it's like, wow, okay, because we need, we need to be able to say to, to students, honestly, that part of this very strange thing we're supposed to do in higher education is to, um, to cultivate the ability to stand somewhat outside of yourself and be curious about that that idea that you might think is offensive and leave that to one side because the because how offensive something is to you honestly has basically no relationship to whether or not it's true and and that's one of the great realizations one of the reasons why i like the discovery of ignorance being part of it so uh, I think that having a class like that, um, having orientation sessions like that, that prepare a students very, but in, in, in a very clear way, not, not sugarcoating it, saying like there, you, there are expectations on you. We, uh, curiosity is a value, it's a transcendent value. And if that student says something that really makes you angry, 
your first response should be asking yourself, why do they think that? I want to know why they think that it is a big part of it. When it comes to do what techniques you can use when you're already in a situation like you are, um, some of the interesting stuff, and this is Daniel Kahneman's you know, stuff to a degree, and this is also something that Cass Sunstein's done a great uh, job uh, highlighting, you know, having people write down, uh, uh, do things anonymously, you know, like pulling people individually and how they fall on this kind of stuff and making sure that they know that I'm not going to say who in the class, you know, has this opinion. Um, you have to be kind of careful around, you know, if there's, if you know, there's only like one conservative in the class, you, know, you don't necessarily, but, you, but you'll know that from tra having some of these one-on-one -on -one interactions. Because I'd like to say, well, it's completely nuts that they're afraid that, stu that a student in that classroom could ruin their career. Not. Um, the, when, when we look, we currently have a database of 550 plus scholars who, um, and unfortunately, usually it's students. It's not always students. It's also administrators um, that uh, there's been a campaign to get them fired. And they're about two thirds successful, not always fired, but, but, but punished in some, in, in some way. How much more often that's coming from what they say in class was something I was pretty horrified, uh, horrified discovery. But shoot, shoot me an email afterwards. They're, they're, I think it's just it's an iterative process and trying out different ways to make students more comfortable to be able to engage. I, I think that that's that, that's a win-win. That's great. And uh, by the way, we, we had a, an earlier, apparently there is a, a colleague at, at FIRE in the organization that is with with how this can be taught, so we, we'll we'll be in conversations. Cause I, I think yeah. it'll be really interesting. She, she'd be really. She'd, um, I, uh, the, our chief researcher um, for the book is, is Pamela Fratsky, a, a really good friend of mine, and she's doing a project called Habits of a Free Mind. And she actually had a class based on this at University of Chicago. Um, and I want to put put you all in touch because she'd be excited yeah. to share. Should they continue? That. That's that's terrific. Uh, I understand there may be a couple of uh, questions online. You want to read them both and you can address them as you please. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, so to dovetail into the conversation that you just had about in the classroom, yep. uh, what can an institution do to encourage actual discussion of diverse viewpoints uh, among just friends at a social level? So this person is saying, my understanding from many high school and college students, they're simply horrified that any of their friends might find out if they have a conservative view. Yeah. And it's not even just conservative points of view. It, it's heterodox views of, of all over the spectrum. Um, the fact that we have a situation where people aren't even giving their friends the benefit of the doubt to, to be a thoughtful person and have a heterodox point of view or ha have a, um, a non- you know, stereotypical point of view for your group uh, is th things have gone really bad deep, deep down. I, I think that I actually am still friends with my best friend since I was three, my best friend since I was 13, and my best friend from law school. And I've introduced them all to each other. So, like, I have, like, my group of friends. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. Well, it's, it's fun to hang out with them, too. But, yeah, when, when friends aren't even giving each other the benefit of the doubt to be honest and, and real, um, something has gone wrong. And it's one of these things, like it, American society, and it, it's one of those things that sometimes is sort of like associated with hip hop, but it runs much deeper than that. There is this idea of keeping it real, that essentially that there's an authentic self, um, and that if you take on errors, if you try to make other people happy, that you're not true to yourself, that that's somehow um, uh, an impingement, like th that's considered to be unfortunate, you know, that, that essentially like that's not truly being an individual in, in the best sense. And I feel like right now, in the, over the past 10 years, people are hiding themselves. People are way too scared of what they think their friends are going to think. And it is frankly getting, it, it is worse in, in more elite um, atmospheres. Uh, it, when I go to state schools, um, they still, even though there, there are, there might be more taboos than there used to be, they can still have arguments. But the, um, the very kind of doctrinaire sort of like, you need to be fired from this institution if you have this opinion, it's gotten even worse just in the past two or three years, um, and, I, and I'm not totally sure um, where you even start with it. But you know, just not that I have a good answer for this. But if you've reached the point where your friends are going to disown you if you have the wrong opinion, um, that breaks my heart. You said you had another one. Let's go through this. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this one is from Chen Zhao. Uh, do you think that the media and colleges seem to teach to use bad interpretations? What a great question. Um, do I think that the media uh, teaches to um, um, 
to use bad interpretations. I think that, um, yes, I, I think that uh, if, particularly if you're getting a lot of your news from, um, you know, when I, when I was younger, you know, The Daily Show was huge. And I love The Daily Show, and I think John Stewart is very funny. Um, but it did kind of teach you a sort of snarky way of, or basically, if you could ever, with any amount of evidence, even thin evidence, show that someone, for example, was a hypocrite, um, e even if you're wrong, that's 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 huge. That's props. That's that's a mic drop moment. You're like you've you've won essentially. A really lousy way to argue uh, to begin with. Constantly assuming everyone's a hypocrite and constantly going after it. I do think the media has gotten way worse in the idea um, of going after people for, you know, old tweets, for example. Um, you know, particularly when people, I mean, there was a girl from Teen Vogue who had to step down because of something she wrote that wasn't sensitive, but she wrote it when she was like 14. And it's like, okay, we've always known that people, you know, um, say things that they regret when they were teenagers. We're really going to expect someone to step down from a position because of that? Now we're just, now we're just seeing, now we're just seeing that. I, I do think that we are modeling atrocious behavior about how to have good dialogue and how to actually respect people's ability to, even for that matter, respect people's, uh, the fact that sometimes people are going to be wrong. Um, and I think the media has made it worse. I also think that social media um, uh, gives you tremendous juice, tremendous likes for that substanceless, but, non like, uh, but nonetheless um, sort of uh, crushing um, dismissive comments, uh, those get retweeted and the thoughtful comments often don't. Question in the back of the room. Hi, I'm Hadi Gul. I'm a computer science sophomore at the College of Computing. And my question ties up into the question that was asked just before me. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering that you said that there's been shift towards punishment for wrong opinion. Like, you know, professors get fired or people get canceled on the social media. Yeah. So I was wondering as a student, like, who self-censors and, like, you know, conservative opinion, how do you deal with the criticism that you receive? Um, I, I, you're asking me for tips on how to deal with it or, or how did I, how do I deal with it personally or? Yeah. He wants tips. Oh, okay, yeah. Just like <laughs> tips as a like, college student, how can I deal with it? And, like... Yeah, I, I, I remember, um, okay, the best advice I ever got on this was I, I have, you know, a couple people that I'm proud to call mentors, um, but one of them, frankly, tended to give me not so great advice. And he, I remember telling him this because being in the culture war is exhausting. Like uh, people want to tear you down right, left and center all the time. And it was so bad. I was hospitalized. I, I got, I got suicidally depressed. You know, so I, I believe me, it, 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 it hit me, it hit me quite hard. And I remember when I started feeling really run down by the whole thing, I asked him, you know, like what, 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 what he thinks. And his advice was, well, you know, if if you really care what people think, I mean, that's something, you know, wrong with you. You know, like that's something. And I was like, if you're not a sociopath, I mean, like, like human beings are social animals. We care what people think of, uh, think about each, uh, each other. That's crazy. Like like you know, like the people who genuinely don't care at all what anybody thinks of them are are scary people in some cases. And then I asked Harvey Silverglade, um, who is the co-founder of Fire, um, and he's a, a a famous liberal libertarian defender of freedom of speech. And he said, Greg, if you're going to do anything important in your life, people are going to hate you for it. So you can only really care about what 10 people in the world think of you and choose those people very carefully. Mm. And I was like, wow, that was fantastic advice. But what I'm hearing here that makes me also sad and worried for you guys is just the idea that maybe there are people that you really feel are within those 10 people and they will still look down on you um, if, they, if they know your opinion. And where you begin even with that, even with the idea of sort of like a principle of, of, of charity within your friends, um, I wish I had I wish I had better advice. I mean, I think the, um, you know, sometimes like slow exposure to points of view uh, that, that, you, that you disagree with can help. But I mean, for me, some amount of I, I kind of wish every time I, I wish we had the equivalent of the Google Glass thing. And that every time someone on a college campus thinks something is a opinion completely beyond the pale, that only truly evil people who should be immediately fired or expelled have, and then see how that polls nationally, how that polls globally, how that polls in different countries. Because that, that was one of the things that also made me sort of like think that my the weird Stanford bubble was so 
um, so exclusionary because I'm kind of like, you really are okay with making gross generalizations about middle American evangelical white people when some of the things that you are you were absolutely savaging for are people that all over the world agree with, like deeply religious people all over the world share some of these views. Like, do you think they're all evil and stupid? Um, I, I, I think sometimes understanding how rare the point of views that are very popular on campus actually are globally might help people be a little bit more compassionate and open-minded, but who knows? <laughs> it, uh, we have, uh, Stephen, you have the microphone. Okay, make a fast question, you two, and then we'll wrap it up to be yes. on time, okay? Hi, uh, Stephen Ike, I'm the graduate student body president here at Georgia Tech. Um, we, you made a great comment about how th there appears to be something unique going on at the elite sort of institutions. Uh, one observation that came to my mind was that the elite institutions are very international. We draw people from, th those institutions, particularly Georgia Tech, draws people from all around the world, yeah. where the First Amendment, these, these rights, just aren't necessarily as embedded in their society yeah. as ours is. As, and so my question is, do you think there are any unique considerations that we need to be thinking about as academic leadership when working to um, address free speech issues on these elite campuses? I, I mean, I come to the, from a completely different conclusion on that. Um, you know, also partially because my family is Russian. Oh, and by the way, despise Putin, horrified about what's going going on at the moment, just to be very clear um, what, what kind of Russian I am. Um, the, but there, there is a, a, a sort of Russian norm of ferocious, you know, honesty. Um, and they think that we are all very weak and stupid about the fact that we won't be like frank with each other. Um, and I'm saying that as them, that's not the way I refer to us. Um, the, uh, and, and that I do think that the international environment does require a lot more benefit of the doubt, a lot more coming of, of open mindedness of, of figuring out where people are coming from. When you look at, and this is something blazingly clear um, in the research that we were doing after Codling came out. The extreme um, change in opinion to be much, much more absolutist and much more sort of radicalized, it's overwhelmingly white people. And I know that may sound, might sound weird, but when you look at the polling for where people fall on some of, some of these political issues, um, it's, uh, it, there wasn't a, 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 a very dramatic move among uh, black Americans, among, from any other back, background, other, but there was like a multi, um, uh, like a, a multi-standard deviation shift for white Americans that it was much more pronounced among wealthy white Americans. So when you see, a, honestly, I think it's more about a bubble, a, a, a wealth and privilege bubble that is so guilty about wealth and privilege, it kind of consumes all, all the rest of it. And that can be something that um, I think because so many people are also coming from families that are from that, uh, you, you know, who are relatively wealthy as well, um, the fact that like more working class kids being introduced to these environments, I actually think would help a lot. It would lead to a lot more conflict, but good conflict in my opinion. But I, but I do think that I think people really do need to know things like that, that overall kind of like the, you know, you know what Matty Iglesias called the Great Awakening is overwhelming the phenomenon of relatively privileged white kids um, is something that people need to understand. It doesn't mean they don't have a point, but it does mean that kind of like the idea that this is representative of the rest of the country is just not true. Right. Yes. Uh, we're running out of time. So uh, I'll, I'll try to answer it real as fast quick, as I can. And you answer the question and you get to also make your wrap up oh, thank you. thought for us. Thank you so much for being here. I read your book a couple years ago, and it's very powerful to me. Um, anyway, my question is about free speech in an age where we have so much fake news that is generated both sure. domestically, um, and this has come to the forefront of the news in censorship about various issues, specifically the war in Ukraine yeah. abroad in different different states. Um, Anyway, how do we deal with free speech in an era where often we can't even agree on basic facts with our interlocutors? Sure. Um, we have one of our representatives from Georgia who was talking about the California wildfires being started by Jewish space lasers, right? Um, how do we – do you have any tips for um, – well, one, what is the role of free sure. speech in this with – with fake news, how do we deal with that legally, and then how can we deal with that in conversations with um, with friends, family members, et cetera? 
Sure. Uh, disinformation is definitely one of the more interesting and genuine threats to how we actually regulate speech. Um, I do think, uh, but the most important thing I want to say is that the, you know, the printing press was this incredibly, was the original disruptive communications technology. And when people talk about, oh, you know, Haidt and Lukianoff, they're talking about social media being so, so bad, but the printing press, people said the same thing about the printing press. The printing press led to 200 years of religious wars. Um, it led to the, to an uptick in the, in, in the witch trials. Like the, it was an incredibly, um, disruptive technology. And that was just getting more, getting millions of people to be able to, con to communicate with each other. We are very early in the stage where we have billions of people communicating with each other. And that's, there's no way that can't be an extremely anarchical, extremely disruptive period. So we're currently in this and there's no way out of this that isn't, uh, you know, this isn't crazy because it's absolutely historically unprecedented. Um, my friend, uh, Jakob Mishingama, uh, came out with a great book called Free, Free Speech, um, not, not, not the most distinctive title. Um, but it, but it just came out and he, and he has some really interesting data on that we tend to, uh, we tend to exaggerate the role of disinformation and misinformation in American society and globally, like how much of, of, of that information people actually consume on a daily basis. Um, it tends to really get our attention when it's things like Jewish face lasers. Um, but it's, uh, the data seems to indicate that it's probably less of a problem than we think. Now, as far as things that, um, that responses that would scare me, um, it's that we know what the truth is. Top-down responses to disinformation are terrible ideas because basically you'd have to have be, be omniscient, you know, no, no, no truth to begin with. And truth, of course, is a process that's, that's never truly over and it's iterative and all this kind of stuff. So I'm a, at this point, I'm probably more afraid of the, um, uh, of, I'm more afraid of the cure uh, uh, to misinformation than I am of the disease. That, that essentially, I think that some of the ideas for fixing it would leave us still saying, like we did at the beginning of COVID, that actually masks aren't helpful to prevent COVID. I, I don't know if you guys remember the, the, this at the beginning, but there was partially because they were trying to preserve masks. They let everybody uh, believe that masks actually don't stop the spread of COVID. They're only for protecting you. And this was something that seemed to be done with like you know, their heart in the right place. But every time uh, people feel like experts are lying to them, and sometimes they do, that that actually creates a, a greater market for these fringe and often completely wrong uh, sources of information. So I, I don't think there's any easy way through it. I do think that there is um, a lot of distrust in experts and in journalists at the moment. And depending on who we're talking about, some of them have done some stuff to deserve that. I, I think that there, there, there should be a there's going to have to be a rebuilding of trust in expert and journalistic institutions. Um, and I don't think we're taking that. We're doing enough to actually work towards that at the moment. Any closing parting thoughts for us? Um, but, uh, well, uh, Other than good luck. Yeah. Uh, what I've heard here today is definitely going to stick with me. Um, the, in, the, the fact that this is really interfering with people's friendship relationships and ability to, to, to talk across lines of difference among their friends, that really, that's something you, I see it on paper all the time. But hearing it as a theme among the questions is very sad and it's not the way things should be. Um, but like I said, don't give up hope. We are in a very weird period, period in human history. Billions of people have not been able to talk to each other like this before, and it's going to be a strange moment. My hope is that if we value our friends, if we value honesty, if we value candor, we already value freedom of speech. Um, and I think that we can get out of this with a new system for proving what is true um, that's even more accurate than, that, than what we had last time. Uh, but we must not uh, give up on it um, with some kind of quick fix answer. There's never an easy fix to a problem that's this broad when it's about the nature of truth itself. So don't give up. Let me um, um, close the event with your closing sentence in the book. Mm -hmm. This is a book about education and wisdom. If we can educate the next generation more wisely, they will be stronger, richer, more virtuous, and even safer. Amen to that. Thank you, sir, for being with us today. Thank you.